Why don't you just get out of here? Go freeze in the yard, you stupid, useless old woman. I'm getting cold. Please unlock the door, I pleaded. My eldest son's wife was found in the yard the next morning, cold and shivering. My name is Lucy. I am a 60-year-old housewife, and my husband got sick and passed away several years ago. My son Tom, his wife Mary, and my grandson Alan now live with me. The unexpected death of my husband brought us together, but I felt like I was giving my son and his family enough space and not interfering with them. They thought that being too close would be suffocating for everyone. They did a lot of renovations to have as much privacy as possible. Mary is upbeat and social. She often socializes with a large group of friends. Maybe it was for the best that we rarely saw each other. Alan, my grandson, is in fourth grade. I occasionally look after Alan when she goes out. He is absolutely adorable. Tom is busy with work and works at night, so our schedules don't line up, and I barely speak with him. Tom and Mary never fought, and they occasionally went out together, so to me, it didn't seem like their marriage had any major problems. Mary had many friends and hosted parties at her home a lot. She has kept in touch with her mom friends from Alex's kindergarten class, and they are all good friends. They would come over to our house once a week on Fridays and have a party. These parties always bothered me. They started in the evening and didn't end until late at night, with people drinking and being loud. Her friend's husbands would occasionally come over and get drunk, too. They didn't care if Alan got sleepy or hungry, so Alan would come to my room a lot when he was bored. One time, an ambulance was called because a drunken friend of hers slipped and fell into glass and was covered in blood. Another time, a fight between couples became so heated that they were on the verge of calling the cops. It was always me who calmed Alan down and apologized to the neighbors the next day for causing a scene. Mary didn't want the parties to stop, and she looked forward to them every week. I considered talking to Tom about it, but since he worked the night shift on Fridays, he had never witnessed these parties, and I didn't feel comfortable confronting him. I expressed my concerns about Alan to Mary once. Don't you think they're a bit much? I don't want the police or an ambulance, Khalid. It's bad for Alan. I'll look out for Alan on Fridays, so why don't you all go to a restaurant outside and drink responsibly? I'm not allowed to unwind. Living together stresses me out more than you know. Wouldn't you feel the same if you were in my shoes? Plus, going out to drink costs more money than doing it at home. I can't tell them they can't come here. You don't know how I feel. She was furious and refused to speak to anyone. Then there was one Friday. Alan was drowsy when he got home from school. He said he felt tired. I took his temperature, and he had a 100-degree fever. Of all days, it's for day. Everyone will be here soon. So why don't you go to your room and sleep so you don't bother us? Why don't you just cancel, just for today? I held back what I really wanted to say. Then I'll watch Alan today. Is that all right, Mary? But she refused probably because she knew I was annoyed. It's all right, she said. I don't need you to be worried. We're not that loud. Why is it always the mom's fault when a kid gets sick? I didn't mean to imply that it was her fault, but I had no choice but to say something. If you start feeling bad, come to my room, I told Alan. I have some TV shows we can watch tonight. I'm planning to stay up late. Thanks, Grandma, he replied. I'll be all right. I felt a little better, but it was still a significant day. I could hear them all being very loud from my room. I heard a faint knock on my door. I was worried about Alan. I rushed to open the door, and Alan was standing there. Can I spend the night with you? He cried. I can't sleep because my head hurts. Even when I cover my ears, it's so loud. I rushed him into the room and handed him a drink, which he drank in one gulp, most likely because he was thirsty. His hands felt hot, so I took his temperature, which had risen to 102. For the first time in a long time, I was fuming, but I resisted because taking care of Alan was more important than telling Mary off. Alan still had a fever the next morning and still looked sick as ever. Alan looks sick, so I think we should take him to the hospital this morning, I told her, because most hospitals only see patients in the morning on Saturdays. I told her, but she couldn't get out of bed probably because she had been drinking late the night before. Oh, don't worry. It'll get better soon, 
You'll be fine, right, Mary? I said. Alan. She spoke in a sleepy tone, not even looking up from her bed. Alan responded. But he was clearly not fine. Alan has had asthma since he was a child, so he is prone to asthma attacks when he is sick. As I stood there watching him, fearful that he would have another attack, he started to wheeze, just as I had predicted. Mary, I think Alan is having an asthma attack. Where is his medicine? I asked. But Mary was sleeping through it and wouldn't say anything. All right, I'm going to take him to the emergency room, okay? I told her this several times before I took Alan to the hospital. I was able to get him back for inhalation and medication. I was so relieved to see Alan feeling better. When Mary woke up that evening, she exploded. Don't be selfish. He didn't need to go to the hospital. How much did going to the emergency room cost you? I can't believe it. I tried to talk to you many times, but you drank too much and couldn't wake up. Can't you just stop drinking when Alan is sick? He was in a lot of pain. Fever is common in kids, and it's already gone away, so it wasn't a big deal. Asthma flare-ups are also common. Don't be a jerk and spoil him just because he's your grandson. I thought I should tell Tom about it, so I did, but he said, But Alan is fine, right? He said. Don't worry about a kid's cold. Mary is under a lot of stress about the living situation, so please be patient with her. I need you to take a step back because you live together. Message received. I couldn't say anything back when he talked about the stress of living together. Tom was here at work one day at the end of the year. He needed surgery and spent the week in a hospital. Tom spent the holidays and the end of the year there. I'm thinking of spending this New Year's holiday at my parents' house for the first time in a while, Mary said one day. In the past, our family's New Year's holidays were spent cleaning up, eating our favorite comfort food, and dining out with my eldest daughter, Emily, and her family, who live in the same city. I heard Mary and her parents were estranged, so I wondered what had suddenly happened. But if she could get refreshed at her parents' house, that's great for me. Spending time with his loving relatives would make Alan happy. That's great. You're going to bring Alan, aren't you? I bet your parents are excited. I'll bring him while I'm there. Could you check on Tom? Of course. Other than visiting Tom, I'll be alone for New Year's this year. If you're going to spend the holidays alone... Oh, why don't you come to our house this year? Emily responded. So I decided I would. Mary and I were both supposed to leave the house on New Year's Eve. I was sweating as I cleaned the house that day. Maybe it was because I was getting older, but cleaning felt like a chore I'd been putting off for a long time. Mary was gone for the morning because she needed to go shopping, so I ended up doing as much of the cleaning as I could on my own. When Mary got back from shopping, she started fidgeting with her watch. Lucy, what time do you plan to leave? She asked. Aren't you done yet? Um, when should I leave? I don't have an exact time in mind. I'm not sure I'll finish now that I've done so much more. What about you? What time do you plan to leave? If you leave first, I'll double-check that all the doors are locked and everything. No, we don't have a specific time in mind, so we'll be fine. Mary, who seemed annoyed for some reason, pushed me outside as I was taking a break from cleaning the front door since my back was hurting. She also threw my stuff outside as if to throw it at me, and she said, Oh my God, how long are you going to keep cleaning, you slowpoke? Go freeze in the yard, you useless old woman. I was sweating profusely from all the cleaning and was dressed in thin clothes, so when I was thrown out into the yard, I was cold and chilly. It was snowing outside, Mary. Let me in. I haven't changed my clothes. I'm freezing. You shouldn't be so slow. Why don't you just leave? My coat had been thrown out with my luggage, so I put it over my sweaty t-shirt for the time being. I couldn't get into the house because both the front door and the kitchen door were locked. I called Mary's name for a while, but she didn't respond, so I gave up. I decided to take a train to Emily's house because there was nothing else to do. I made it there. What's wrong? Why are you in such thin clothes? Emily asked, surprised to see me. Get inside, you'll catch a cold. Have you seen Bob? He was worried about you because it was snowing, so he headed to pick you up. He said he texted you. Only then did I realize I left my phone at home. 
Emily's son, Bob, is a college student. I felt bad for him because he'd driven all the way there to pick me up, and we missed each other. Emily texted Bob and told him that I came by train. Then Bob told us something shocking. I called you several times, but you never returned my calls. Then I heard a ringtone coming from inside the house. I assumed you were sick, so I went inside on my own. The front door was unlocked for some reason. I found your phone in the living room and figured you weren't there. But then I heard noises coming from upstairs. I went up because I thought maybe it was a robber. It makes sense that Bob would think it's a robber since the door was unlocked, I thought. Then I noticed Mary and an unknown man hugging in the bedroom. What? Mary had her to her parents' home with Alan? I was taken aback and froze for a minute. They jumped off the balcony into the yard wrapped in a comforter, so I dashed after them and looked around the yard, but I couldn't find them. They escaped. You let them escape. I don't think they got hurt because of the bushes and the snow on the ground. I locked the second-floor door and was about to leave when I heard a noise from the next room and saw Alan. Alan was small enough to hide behind Bob. Sorry, my mom told me not to leave my room until after the new year, Alan said. He was sitting in his room surrounded by a bunch of sweets, bread, and juice. I brought Alan here because I thought he'd have more fun and be more comfortable here. I made sure to lock the front door. The key is under the flower pot. I'm glad nothing has changed since I was a kid. You did a good job of shutting the door, Mother. I believe it's time to discuss the future with Tom. Let's play some games, Alan, Mary said, and the two happily exited the room. I'm not interested in Mary's affair right now. They can talk it out or do whatever they want, but I can't forget what she did to Alan, I thought. We spent that night relaxing with Emily and the others because it was already dark. Emily, Bob, and I went back home the next morning. We chose to leave Alan with Emily's husband. When we got home, we noticed a figure at the front door. It was Mary. She was barefoot and trembling, wrapped in a comforter. Ah, there she is. You locked me out, Mary said, shivering in the cold and chattering her teeth. We went into the house so Mary could warm up. At this point, I couldn't even speak to her. Eventually, I broke the ice once Mary stopped shivering. I heard from Bob. Who are you with on the second floor? What are you talking about? You've got the wrong person, Mary replied defensively. And Bob, what are you doing breaking into someone's house? Why didn't you press the intercom button? I noticed a pair of men's shoes near the entrance. But are those Tom's? Let me ask him, I said. Uh, there was a thief in the house, Bob replied nervously. I was about to start a fight when I was surprised. It was a close call. That's a big deal. I guess we need to call the cops, Emily said, taking out her phone. Stop. I see what you're doing. Okay. You caught me. So who the hell is that man? Mary lowered her head and didn't respond. Didn't you jump off the balcony with that man? What happened to him? Where is he? I asked. He left a long time ago, Mary replied. She was surprised to be abandoned by the man she was having an affair with, and she spent the entire night barefoot, wrapped in a comforter, and he had left and gone home. Oh, he left you? How sad, I said sarcastically. Mary's face became flushed as Bob's words struck a nerve. How could you not take care of Alan? Did you plan to lock him in the room while you were having fun? I'm not interested in your affair, but I just can't forgive you for what you did to Alan. I agree with her. In fourth grade, he can be alone just fine. I may be his mother, but that doesn't obligate me to prioritize him in my life. I have things I want to do as well. Just because he's my son doesn't give him the right to interfere. This caught me off guard. Emily, Bob, and I were all speechless by our rage and shock. Tom will be released from the hospital shortly. Alan and I were to stay at Emily's house until then. The day came for Tom to be released. We decided to have the discussion at our house, but I didn't want Alan to be there. Mary may say something hurtful to Alan. I decided to let him have some fun with Bob. I asked Bob to play with him. Emily, you're here. What's wrong? Emily told Tom the facts in a straightforward way. What do you mean, Mary? Is this true? Well, you were busy with work, and I was lonely. Please accept my apology. Mary, did you lock my mother out of the house in the snow? 
No, that's not it. And what about locking Alan in the next room for a long time while having an affair? Tom, Mom told you about the Friday night parties, didn't she? Why didn't you and Mary discuss it? I'm not sure how to go about it. The most important thing to remember is to never be afraid to ask for help. I'm tired from work, too, and it's been a pain. And I'm sure Mary has a lot to say about living with Mom. You two are a perfect match. You both run away from problems and take the easy way out. Do you ever think about others? You two should talk about it and decide what you're going to do together. You're both adults. But you have to think about Alan. I won't let you turn your back on him. They decided to divorce a few days later. Mary was ordered to pay child support and alimony to Tom, who had custody. Mary admitted everything, and the divorce went smoothly. We never found out who she was cheating with. Mary refused to say anything, and Tom was too busy establishing a new life for himself and Alan to worry about it. But three months later, the other man's family found out about the affair, and we learned who he was. To my surprise, the other man was married to one of Mary's mom friends. It was one of the men who came to the Friday night party sometimes. He and Mary continued their relationship after she and Tom divorced. The reason she easily agreed to the divorce was that she didn't want anything about the parties to come out. I don't understand how she could keep dating a man who abandoned her in the snow while she was freezing. Mary stayed with him even though she had to pay child support and alimony. The other man's wife demanded alimony and that she distance herself from him. Then I kept thinking about how the front door was unlocked that day. They were both too focused on the affair and had forgotten to lock the door. Bob would have rung the intercom if it had been locked. I told Bob that even if the door was unlocked and he suspected there was a burglar, he shouldn't have gone in because he could have been attacked. Because I was worried about Grandma, he explained. Those two would have been surprised that the cops showed up out of nowhere and caught them cheating. I'm not experienced enough. Because, well, you know, he's a bit of a jerk, but he tries to make everyone laugh, and he treats Alan like his own brother. Mary had a lot of friends, and word of the affair spread quickly to everyone. She left the area, most likely because it was hard for her to live in the same city. Apparently, the group of friends harassed them quite a bit until they moved. They are living a life they can't afford in a new place. They have to spend money on Alan, pay alimony to Tom, and pay alimony to his ex-wife. Mary is at odds with her parents and is working tirelessly with no help. She called our house once. I'm so sorry, she said. I'm lonely. And I'm suffering because I don't have anyone to turn to. Please forgive me. Please help me. Oh, it was one thing to want to see or talk to Alan, but it was another thing to want to avoid responsibility for what she had done. The kids of Mary's mom, friends bullied Alan for a while because of Mary. Tom was able to talk to their parents, and the kids fixed things amongst themselves. But I wonder how much it broke Alan's heart for his mother to disappear and then be bullied by his friends. I thought about telling Mary how hard it is for Alan, but I doubt she would care. Is that all you want to say? I asked. Don't contact me. That's all, I said before hanging up the phone. I moved in with Tom and Alan. There have been ups and downs, and there will be more downs, but we will work together to overcome them. Tom also cut back on his work hours and began spending more time with Alan. I'd also like to thank Emily and her family for their help during all this. Emily said many things I should have said. Bob loves Alan, and the two became like brothers. I hope he will be raised right in a warm family. I'm glad I get to watch him grow up.